Seaman, Chapter 5, Sioux Territory, August 27th through October, 1804. On the 27th of August, as the boats passed the mouth of the James River, an Indian boy swam over to one of the pierogies. Some of the men could speak a few words of the teenager's language, and others knew sign language. Soon enough, the explorers understood that the boy was a Yankton Sioux. The captains asked him to bring some of his tribe to a meeting. At last, the Corps of Discovery was about to come face to face with the mighty Sioux. The meeting took place three days later, on August 30th, at Calumet Bluffs. Again, the men wore their dress uniforms and staged a military display. Again, Captain Lewis gave a speech about the new white father and his plans for trade with the Indians. The captains passed out medals and small presents to the Yankton chiefs. The Indians dressed up for the occasion in buffalo robes and jewelry made of porcupine quills and feathers. Four Yankton musicians played as the chiefs assembled for the meeting. After the soldiers' military display, the Yankton staged their own display of skill and strength. They organized a competition to show off their boys' ability to shoot with bows and arrows. That evening, assembled around three campfires, the Indians told stories and songs to the music of drums and rattles. The singers acted out great deeds in battles. Each singer, his skin painted with vivid covers, leaped and swirled to make his story come alive. The explorers loved the entertainment. To show their pleasure, they threw gifts to the performers. Bells, small patches of tobacco, a few knives. Even the captains were impressed with the Yanktons and thought them handsome and well-dressed. Unlike the men, Seaman did not relax during the party. He was nervous around so many strangers, their unfamiliar smells, movements, and sounds. He padded restlessly around the merry camp, his ears alert and his eyes watching closely. He never growled at the Yanktons, but he avoided their touch. He settled down beside Lewis for a few minutes, then moved to sit near Clark or Coulter or another of the men. While the Braves danced, Seaman wandered over to York and sat down. The Indians were especially interested in York because of his dark skin. They swirled close to him, inviting him to join their dance. York laughed and clapped his hands to the music. At one point, he leaped up and danced a short jig. He tried to draw Seaman into the fun, but the dog sat stiffly and wouldn't play. The next morning, another formal meeting was held with the Indians. This time, the Yankton chiefs made their speeches. The captains gave out gifts of tobacco, but the Indians were not pleased with other, either tobacco or metals. They wanted practical gifts, such as guns and ammunitions, and they said so. Although the Yanktons were openly disappointed with the generosity of their new white father, the Corps could not afford to give away vital supplies. They had a long journey ahead of them. All in all, both groups parted with mixed feelings. The meeting had been friendly and enjoyable, but not completely satisfying. Soon after the explorers said goodbye to the Yanktons, they realized that one of their men was missing. George Shannon had not returned from a hunting trip. Nobody had any reason to think young Shannon would desert. The captains were sorely worried. The evening campfires did not seem so cozy without Shannon's songs. Seamen roamed restlessly about the camp. On August 30th, the captain sent John Coulter, an excellent tracker, to try to find Shannon. What had happened to the youngest man in the Corps of Discovery? Had he been captured by the Sioux? As the explorers paddled and pulled and pulled their boats upstream, they were constantly looking out for Shannon. They kept up with Coulter's progress by noting the muddy tracks he left alongside the river. The men also watched for more Indians. On the 7th of September, Lewis whistled for seamen. He and Clark were eager to inspect the countryside. The look of the land had been changing gradually as the Missouri, Missouri River left the Great Plains and moved into the Northern Plains. The captains walked along the river and gazed through trees at the rolling prairie. Seamen picked up the scent of fresh deer droppings. A herd of elk was just visible in the distance. Clark spotted ripe yellow plums growing on small trees, and the captains stopped to feast on the soft, delicious fruit. Seamen wandered onto the grassy prairie and noticed a small squirrel standing on its hind legs. He sprang toward it, but the squirrel seemed to vanish. Seamen twirled, looking for the quick-footed creature. It popped up a few yards away and chattered in a thin, squeaky voice. Seamen darted after it, but it disappeared again. Then, as if by magic, it popped up a few yards to the right. This time, Seaman hesitated. The little squirrel watched him. Suddenly, a second one popped up, its beady eyes alert. Then a third stood up and made a whistling squeak. Seaman turned round and round, watching in confusion as little creatures popped up all around him. The captains caught up, intrigued that Seaman seemed to be dancing. 
Lewis called, and Seaman came slowly, glancing behind him at the odd little creatures that were standing and watching him. Lewis stroked Seaman's big head. It's all right, boy, he said, grinning. These animals are not like the squirrels back home. They seem to have escape tunnels, and they slip into their holes before you can pounce on them. Clark dropped to his knees to examine one of the holes. I wonder how far down this tunnel goes. I don't see any sign of the creature hiding in here. He stood up and shaded his eyes with one hand to see how far the collection of holes extended. Hundreds of holes stretched out over an area larger than the grounds of Camp Wood. Quite an army of these little creatures out here, I'd say. I'd like to capture one of these animals and send it home to our scientists, said Lewis. I've never seen a squirrel that makes tunnels like these. I'm going to get the men. We'll dig into one of the tunnels right now. Lewis came back, bringing shovels and a pole, as well as most of the men. They dug six feet through hard clay following one tunnel, but didn't reach the animal. When the diggers paused to wipe the sweat off their foreheads, York stuck the pole into the hole. Look, he said, this here hole goes farther than the length of this pole. We've dug as deep as a proper grave, but we haven't even dug halfway to the end of this tunnel. Lewis ordered the men to stop digging. No use digging up half the prairie, he snapped in frustration. He ran his hands through his hair, trying to think of another way to capture one of the squirrels. Seems we're not having any better luck than seamen, Clark said cheerfully. What do you say we give it up, Merriweather? We can just write a description in our field notes. But Lewis was determined to capture one of the creatures. He sent the men back to the river to fetch a barrel of water. They poured the water into the tunnel, expecting to wash the animal out. That didn't work, and Clark was for giving up again. But Lewis refused to budge without his prey, so he sent the men back for another barrel of water. It took five barrels of water before one of the creatures was finally forced to the surface and captured. When they got back to camp, Lewis put the little creature in a cage in the keelboat's cabin. Some of the men had said these little squirrels were called the small dogs of the prairie by French-speaking trappers, but the scientists in the United States had never heard of prairie dogs, so Lewis carefully described them in his notes. Lewis decided to join the hunting parties to get a better feel for the animal life on the northern plains. He shot his first buffalo on September 8th. The next day, Lewis and another man went hunting. Seaman ran through the brush next to them. As they came to a bend in the river, Seaman raised his head and sniffed. The smell of matted buffalo fur and sweat was new to him. As the huge animals moved, they broke the earth with their hooves, overturning clods of grass and filling the air with the smell of fresh dirt. Seaman pranced around Lewis's legs, woofing with excitement. Lewis motioned to Seaman to stay behind. The men crept through the brush, approaching downwind of the herd so they could get close before the buffalo smelt them and stampeded. When the hunters broke into the clearing, Lewis shouted, Get him, seamen! Seamen bounded after the heels of the galloping animals as the men took aim and fired. Lewis and the other hunter each shot a buffalo that day. Seamen ran and chased until he was exhausted. As the men quartered the meat and tied it to poles so they could haul it back to camp, Seamen stretched out on the ground, panting. Pleased with his success as a hunter, Lewis was in a playful mood. He picked up a long stick and urged Seaman to grab holds of an end for a game of tug of war. Seaman ignored the stick and rolled over, sprawling like a tired puppy. Lewis scratched the dog's belly. We've had a fine day's hunting, haven't we, boy? He said, laughing out loud. Coulter never managed to track down Shannon, but on September 11th, the mystery of the missing man was finally solved. As the keelboat rounded a bend, Seaman began to bark excitedly. The men looked puzzled. They had never heard Seaman make this sound. It was higher and louder, more insistent than his everyday barking. Suddenly, one of the men shouted, God be praised! There's George Shannon! The keelboat pull pulled up to the bank, and the men surrounded Shannon. The young man seemed astonished to see the boats. He had assumed the Corps had traveled far ahead of him, and he had given up trying to follow. He had lost one of the two horses he had taken with him. His bullets had run out 12 days before, so he had been eating mostly fruit. His only hope was to meet some trappers who might take him back to a settlement. Shannon was very thin and weak. The men helped him aboard the keelboat, and Seaman jumped in beside him. Shannon sat down, put his arm around the dog's thick neck, and leaned against him for support. Seaman sat very still, examining the young man's weary face. The men handed Seaman some dried meat, and he ate it gratefully as he told his story. Then he rested his head on Seaman's thick fur and fell sound asleep, sitting up. Seaman did not so much as shift his weight until Shannon awoke. They proceeded on. Over the next few days, Clark killed an antelope, and Lewis weighed and measured it, recording another new animal in his field notes. One of the men killed a jackrabbit, and again Lewis described a new type of animal. 
They continued to see vast herds of buffalo. Lewis reported seeing 3,000 animals in one herd. The next encounter with the Sioux started out much the same as the meeting with the Yanktons. On September 23rd, three teenagers swam up to camp. These boys were Teton Sioux, another tribe in the mighty Sioux Nation. The captains made signs for the boys to arrange a meeting with their chiefs. The next day, however, the expedition's relations with Indians turned sour. John Coulter returned from a hunting trip with some freshly killed game tied to his horse. While some of the men were helping to load the meat onto a pierogi, a band of Indians stole the horse. Coulter shouted for help, and there was an argument between the men and the Indians. The following morning, three Teton chiefs and a group of warriors arrived in camp. They brought a buffalo meat as a gift for the white men. The captains gave the Indians some smoked pork in return. Then a formal meeting began. Lewis gave his usual speech about the new white father and the benefits of becoming a trading family, but he soon saw something was wrong. His words were not making a good impression. In fact, the Teton Sioux could not understand anything he was saying. None of the men in the Corps, not even those who had been trappers, could speak the Teton language, so nobody could translate Lewis's speech. As soon as he realized what the problem was, Lewis ended his speech and gave out some medals and other small gifts. Demons stood stiff-legged, watching the Teton Indians. Unlike the Ottos and the Yanktons, the Teton Sioux did not seem friendly. Instead of sitting quietly while Lewis spoke, the Teton chiefs turned to each other and spoke in loud voices. They gestured with clenched fists and sharp, jabbing movements. Unable to sit still, Seaman edged closer to Lewis. Finally, he positioned himself between the Indians and the captain. The gifts did not improve the mood of the Teton visitors. They scowled and their voices became louder. Clearly, they thought they should receive more and better presents. Clark strode up to Lewis and whispered something. Lewis nodded in motion for the three, three chiefs to follow him aboard one of the pierogies. Clark and several men got aboard, and Seaman hopped on board beside Clark. The men rowed out to the keelboat, and the captains, their guests, and Seaman jumped aboard the larger boat. Have a seat, gentlemen, Lewis said in a courteous tone. Then he excused himself and ducked inside the boat's cabin. When he came out, he was carrying a partly filled bottle of whiskey and some glasses. The captains poured each of the chiefs a quarter of a glass of whiskey. The Indians smiled, sniffed the alcohol, and drank with great pleasure. When they finished, they dressed her for more, but the bottle was empty. One of the, them grabbed the empty bottle and sucked out the last few drops. The chiefs scowled and spoke in angry vo voices. Without a common language, the captains could not smooth the situation. Lewis called for a pierogi to come and take the chiefs to shore. This angered the Indians even more. One of the Teton chiefs jumped to his feet and Seaman stepped, stepped forward, a low growl coming from his throat. The Indian froze, glaring at the dog. Sit, Seaman, Lewis said firmly, taking a step forward. Lewis exchanged a glance with Clark. Then he gave the Indian a stern look and the Indian slowly sat down. As soon as the pierogi pulled up next to the keelboat, Clark jumped aboard and gestured for the chiefs to follow. They refused to move. Annoyed, Clark called to seven of the men, push the chiefs aboard this pierogi. We are going to put an end to this nonsense right now. The men rushed to obey Clark Clark's order. As soon as the Indians were aboard the pierogi, the men rowed them toward shore. Lewis stayed aboard the keelboat and positioned himself in front of the swivel gun. Seaman stood at his side. Lewis kept his eyes on the pierogi. When it reached the shore, the chiefs refused to get out. Some of the Teton warriors surrounded the boat and grabbed its bow line and masts. The explorers demanded that the Indians let go, but the Indians glared and spoke in gruff, defiant voices. Enough, shouted Clark. He stood up and drew his sword. He tossed his flame-colored hair out of his eyes and his cheeks flushed to deep red. Along the shore, Teton warriors stretched their bows tight and placed arrows across the strings. They edged closer to the pierogi. Prepare for action, Lewis ordered in a stern voice that could be heard on shore. Aboard the keelboat, men grabbed their rifles and knelt by the sides of the boat. Two men loaded the swivel gun, and Lewis got ready to fire. During one strained minute, nobody moved. Then, Black Buffalo, one of the Teton chiefs, yanked the pierogi's line out of the hands of the Indian warriors. He ordered his men to let go of the mast. He jumped out of the pierogi, with the other two chiefs following him. Aboard the keelboat, Lewis exhaled slowly, but he kept his hands on the swivel gun. This expedition must and will go on, Clark declared, throwing back his shoulders as he faced the line of Teton braves. Our men are warriors.
The Indians could not understand Clark's words, but his meaning was clear from his tone and posture. Still, the Tetons held their ground. They stood facing the pierogi, loaded bows in hand, while their chiefs huddled together, speaking in low voices. Clark approached the chiefs and offered to shake hands. The chiefs turned their backs to him. Angrily, Clark turned on his heel and jumped into the pierogi. The boat was pulling away from shore when black buffalo splashed into the water, calling for Clark. Clark ordered the men to stop rowing, and black buffalo pointed toward the keelboat. He seemed to be requesting a ride on, in the boat. Clark Gantz glanced toward Lewis, then he agreed. He allowed Black Buffalo and two warriors to get into the pierogi. The men rode back to the keelboat, and the Indians and Clark climbed aboard. As evening approached, Black Buffalo made signs that he wanted to sleep in the keelboat. Although the captains agreed, they nervously ordered a heavy guard. Lewis slept little that night, and Seaman did not leave his master's side. The next day, Black Buffalo traveled aboard the keelboat until they came to his village. He invited the captains to visit, and they agreed, hoping to end the tense meeting on a pleasant tone. Seaman stayed beside Lewis as the explorers walked through the Teton Sioux village of almost 100 white teepees. Hundreds of Indians crowded around to stare at them. When the explorers came to a large teepee in the center, the group stopped. Black Buffalo motioned for them to sit in a circle with some of his braves. The Indians passed around a pipe to smoke. The explorers noticed many female captives in Black Buffalo's language. One of the explorers knew some Indian languages, and he tried speaking to one of the captive women. She said she was from a tribe called the Omaha. She explained that there had been a recent battle between the Teton Sioux and the Omahas. In the battle, the Sioux had captured Omaha women and children and had killed and scalped many Omaha braves. That evening, the captains were carried on white buffalo robes back to the central lodge. They watched the Sioux villagers perform a victory dance around a flickering campfire. Some of the Teton men beat sticks on drums made of stretched hides while their women danced. The dancers wore deer hooves tied to their clothes as rattles. They carried scalps won by their husbands in the recent battle. The women leaped up and down, waving the scalps on the ends of sticks. Some Indian men also entered the circle to join the dancing. The explorers threw beads of, or tobacco to encourage the dancers. Seaman sat stiffly beside Lewis. He smelled the dancer's sweat, as well as the rancid odor from the decaying scalps. The hair on the back of Seaman's neck stood up, and his leg muscles tensed. A village dog crept up behind Seaman and sniffed his tail. Seaman jerked his head around and snarled. Lewis placed his hand on Seaman's back. Gently, he bent down and spoke into Seaman's ear. Steady, boy. My nerves are tight as bowstrings, too, but we must hold our tempers. Lewis was speaking to calm himself as much as to quiet his dog. Clark whispered to Lewis, Did President Jefferson give you any instructions for our meeting with the Sioux? Lewis nodded. He wanted us to open up a discussion about trade, like we did with the other Indians. Jefferson warned me about the Sioux, though. He said they were fierce warriors and feared by white traders as well as other tribes. I remember the words he wrote, on that nation, we wish most particularly to make a friendly impression because of their immense power. Suddenly, a young warrior broke out of the dance and gestured angrily at the white men in front of him. The warrior had not received as many gifts as the women dancing near him. He shouted the, at the explorers, then grabbed a drum from one of the players and hurled it onto the ground, cracking it. Then, as he stalked off, he grabbed two other drums and flung them into the fire. After he stomped off, two women retrieved the drums and the dance continued. Lewis exchanged an uneasy glance with Clark. He stroked Seaman's back with a stiff, tense hand. That night, Black Buffalo again insisted on sleeping in the keelboat with the captains. Again, they agreed, but they placed a heavy guard on duty. The captains muttered under their breath. Were the Tetons planning to ambush then? Neither the captains nor Seaman got much sleep. Black Buffalo invited the captains to his village again the next day. The Sioux entertained them with another scalp dance at night but by then the captains were so exhausted they could barely stay awake. All of the explorers were eager to finally say their goodbyes and be on their way. The next morning, Black Buffalo met them at the river with some of his warriors. The Indians grabbed the keelboat's bowline and refused to let go. A line of Indian warriors suddenly appeared along the bank of the river. Black Buffalo demanded some tobacco. Clark turned to Lewis and said, he's testing us, Meriwether. If we give him what he asks, he'll ask for more. Lewis clenched his teeth to prevent angry words from pouring out. 
Seaman nudged Lewis's hand. Lewis took a deep breath and spoke softly. We must remember President Jefferson's instructions. Lewis looked at Clark. The Sioux greatly outnumber us. We must try to hold our tempers, William. Clark frowned. Then he tossed a small plug of tobacco on the bank. He yelled to Black Buffalo, You have told us you are a great man. Show us your influence by taking the rope from your men without coming to hostilities. Clark turned and walked slowly toward the swivel gun to show he intended to back his words with actions, if necessary. Black Buffalo continued to demand tobacco. Lewis's patience had run out. We do not mean to be trifled with, he shouted. Seaman watched the faces of each speaker. He kept an eye on the movements of the Sioux warriors who were holding the keelboat's line. Although we couldn't understand what the Indians wanted or what the captains were shouting, Seaman sensed the mood of both groups. The captains were frustrated and angry, and the Indians were ready to fight. The fur on Seaman's spine stood up. A low growl came from his throat. Black Buffalo insisted on receiving more tobacco. Lewis threw a plug of tobacco at the warriors who held the boat's line. To everyone's relief, the Indians let go. The captains ordered their men to row upstream, and the men quickly grabbed their paddles. As the boat passed a young Indian on the shore, Clark managed to get the last word. If you are determined to stop us, we are ready to defend ourselves, he shouted. Clark knew the brave could not understand his words, but he was so frustrated he needed to shout at someone. Both of the captains were tired and irritated. That night, they ordered the men to pull up on a sandbar. Sandbars were the safest spot for night camp since enemies would have to swim or paddle a boat to reach the soldiers, and the splashing would alert the guard. The explorers ate their evening meal in silence, each man reflecting on the events of the last few days. As soon as the meal was finished, the captains posted guards and went to bed. Seaman settled down between the captain's bedrolls. As he climbed into his bedroll, Lewis broke the silence. I don't think we've seen the last of the Sioux, William. We have to pass through these waters on our return trip. Clark frowned. In my opinion, the Sioux are nothing but pirates, the pirates of the Missouri River. It won't be easy to establish trade between our country and the Indians if the Sioux control the stretch of waterway. Lewis nodded thoughtfully. We need to create a strong bond with the natives upriver. We'll have to urge the other tribes to ignore the Sioux. That's the only way our country will be able to trade with the Indians of the plains. The captains didn't speak for a few minutes. Seaman gave a great noisy sigh and laid his big head on his front paws. At least there was no bloodshed, Lewis said at last. We didn't establish friendly relations, so we can't count our meaning with the Teton Sioux as a success, but at least we avoided a fight.